In the northern part of the kingdom west, this is where Lion's Gate lies. Here the bird sings outside his nest as he greets the morning sunrise. In Lion's Gate, neath the tall fir trees, on your face feel the ocean breeze. Feel the magic that's in the air in Lion's Gate, the fair. Recording. Hey, I see the recording. Recording has now started. That's my cue. Okay. So, greetings and welcome to the Lion's Den. I am Baron Kinrick of Lion's Gate. Today, you will learn to do the Flemish twist. Uh, no, it's not a new country dance. We're talking about the Flemish twist bowstring. Our presenters today are our very own Pelican Goose power couple, Baroness Margaret and Baron James. Together, they have advanced the archery community in the Barony of Lionsgate, in Antiri, and in the kingdom at large. They have both participated in the SCA actively for over 20 years and were the fourth B&B &B of the Barony of Lionsgate from 2010 to 2013. They both entered into the Order of the Pelican in 2018 together. And that was a very fun day. Margaret might still, still likes to glare daggers at me once in a while on that, but uh, both have taught most aspects of target archery to more gentles than we could count. I personally have benefited from their coaching. They have run many practices and made sure the range was set up at events, many times transporting the equipment to and from said events. I hope you're ready to learn about bowstrings and every archer should have a spare in their kit. This skill is not just for the target community, but the combat archery community as well. So I will now hand things over to Margaret and James. Hello there, I'm just saying, is Margaret actually able to talk yet? Okay, I think she's still getting things worked out there. So hi, as I mentioned there, we're going to talk about the bowstring. Oh, and I think Margaret's on now. Claire, I un unmuted myself. Can everybody hear me? Good. I can hear you in duplicate. So what we're going to start off here is the uh, Flemish twist. So there's essentially two types of uh, strings that you can make. That's a continuous loop and the Flemish twist. For most people, the Flemish twist is what they'll usually start with. It's a very traditional way. Um, continuous loop became more popular as it became easier to make have machines make strings. Although a lot of uh, crossbow strings, even in period, were done that way. So uh, you can go ahead and go to the next page. They can't see it until I, I know they can. It. Okay. So what I want to look at here is what bowstring material you want to use. Uh, how many strands do you need to use? How long should the string be for the bow? And what is the purpose of the string jig? And do you want to use a string jig? Because you may have all been told that you have to use a string jig and you don't. So I'm just going to pause here for a moment. So um, we actually have a little PowerPoint here, but we're not got it up on the screen right now. Um, with some of the technical difficulties, we didn't get it quite up there, but I'm just wanting to read some of the stuff there. So uh, period wise, toxophilus, they talk about what a string should be made of, whether it's of good hemp or of flax or silk. Yeah, leave it up to the bowstring maker. So they didn't even tend to make their own. Their archer didn't make their own, they bought it. But we do have from that, what are the three main um, materials that were commonly used at that time? That's hemp, linen, flax, uh, and silk. Now in England, in Europe, it's gonna be mostly hemp and, uh, and linen. Now what we're looking for in a bowstring is a material that's strong and has a minimal stretch. Linen 
has about a 2% stretch. We nowadays kind of use more of a, a modern material. Um, let me just uh, steer from, I grabbed the wrong thing there. I've got some uh, B50 here. It's a polyester. It's got a 45 pound brake strength. Well, a 35 pound brake strength. It's called B50 because it's supposed to break at 50. It really breaks at 35. So it's strong and its stretch is actually 4%. So it's actually a little stretchier than linen is. So if you got linen, it's much better. There's other materials that'll pop up every so often. Now the Brown LB50, which is the standard bowstring making material for traditional bowlers is starting to get harder to get. And so you may see the BCY B55 in a lot of the stores now. And if you're going to uh, uh, Borman's or you're going on to Three Rivers Archery or something like that. You can, of course, do it with, uh, with linen. You can pick up a wax linen uh, from a leather makers or even some of the hobby stores nowadays. Hemp is there as a possibility as well. Now, now every, every so store. often you get people wanting to use things because they've heard of this, they've heard of it. Can I do it with dental floss? And if you're living in 1960, yes, you can. Um, part of the problem with any of these things, and then I say here, caveat emptor, is artificial sinew is designed to make a fake sinew. Dental floss is designed to floss your teeth. They changed the material what it was. At one time, dental floss was wax linen. So therefore it made a bowstring material. It was a perfectly good material to make bowstring. Uh, artificial sinew is usually nylon. I can't guarantee it's gonna always be nylon because different artificial sinews could be made of different things. Some of them might be a polyester is very similar to a B50. Things would be perfectly good. Most of it's going to be nylon. Nylon is very stretchy. We want to avoid nylon. So I would say stick with the B50, the BCY, B55, uh, hemp, linen. I probably wouldn't bother with silk. Um, save it for other things. But uh, linen and hemp are there. You may also want to use something of the other bowstring materials like fast flight. Fast flight's got a very low stretch, but the general thing is, is you want to stay, um, keep it away from traditional bows. The modern bows have got a reinforced knocks that can handle the kind of strength and shock that fast flight have. Um, fast flight's very strong, very low stretch. And part of the problem with that is you don't really need a lot of strings, a lot of strands on it when you overbuild it, it has a tendency that it can give it too much of a shock uh, to your bow if your bow is not designed for it. So when, unless you know your bow can handle fast flight, don't bother with it. And I think Mark's got the slideshow up, so we'll get to go to the next slide. So the number of strands. This is gonna be more important if you're working with uh, linen because what you're going to have to do with the linen is find out what the breaking strength is. Sometimes it'll tell you. I saw some hemp advertised that mentioned it was a 20 pound weight. And it was kind of interesting because in the comments, somebody bought it and complained and said, no way did this weigh 20 pounds. Um, even though it did say that it was said it was a quarter pound uh, worth of, of thread on it there. He didn't understand that 20 pounds was the breaking strength. So if you've just got some, I, I picked up some linen thread recently, went down and did a test on it and it's got about a 10 pound breaking strength. So what I wanna do with that for a safety margin is I wanna take a look at my bow weight and you'll get different numbers. They'll typically be from either four times up to seven times the strength of the bow. So if I've got a 30 pound bow, I would need at least 120 pounds. If I'm, that's with the four times. If 
I'm doing seven times, obviously 210 pounds. Now, I mentioned that the breaking strength of B50 is 35 pounds. If you think about it, all I need is four strands to make a bow. Is this realistic? No. Uh, we would, in reality, probably if we try to make it with four strands, we'd be right on the edge of whether it'd be dangerous, but as well, we'd be cutting our fingers because that uh, thread would be, that string would be too thin. So it would cut into us. So what you almost always find is they will always start off with a B50 is saying, start off with 12 strands. Anything less than that, your arrow is gonna be falling off the string in most cases, unless you cut your own knots. So uh, seven pound multiplier, 210, as I mentioned, that would be the six strands going in there, but you could get away with four strands. Now this can come into efficiency for, I know some of the combat archers will take advantage of this. They're wearing gloves and everything like that. So there's not gonna be as much on the hand. They might go eight strands. They got a 30 pound bow, eight strands is plenty, but it takes a little bit of weight off from the 12 strand string. So a 12 strand string is obviously gonna weigh a third more than an eight strand string is. That can relate to a faster arrow speed. So you wanna sort of look at it along that way, uh, put it in there and go with eight strands. What you can do in some of those cases, just to make it easier on the hand, is add extra strands in right where you're going to be uh, doing the serving. So this is where I say, how many strands do you really know? Um, 12 strands recommend it, up to 16 strands, depending on the weight of the bow. If you've got a, we don't have too many people shooting 80, 90, 100 pound bows, but obviously you'd have to pick that. If you are using something like uh, material that you're doing yourself, linen, you're gonna have to find the break strength. You're gonna work out your four times or your seven times, depending which safety margin you want. I'll let you go to the next slide. I just did. Oh, okay. I could, part of the problem is I'm not looking at what you're all doing there. So how long should your string be? The bow itself, if it's a modern recurve, will have on it a um, AMO number. So I have a bow here. It's uh, marked down there as being 64 on the limb. Mark's trying to show it there. So it's 64 inches on the limb. So typically the actual string length is typically gonna be four inches shorter for a recurve, three inches shorter for a longbow. Longbow typically has a smaller bracing. If you're nuking the bow yourself, you're gonna measure it from knot to knot. Now, if you know what you, like you have an existing string, you could just measure the string. And that's because even though someone might mark their bow as an AMO 64, they may have a preference for how long that string is for a certain brace height. So even though it might be, a, oh, I want a 60 inch string, they might want to put a 59 inch string on there or 61 inch string on there to give them their ideal brace height. So if you know you've got the ideal brace height, you know how long the string, you can work from that. <clears throat> now that's how long the string is, but you need to add extra string material in to make up the loops. So we'll typically use eight inches of uh, the thread, the plies, to make one loop. So how long are we gonna do? We're gonna take the AMO length. So I've got 64 inches from my boat there. I'm gonna subtract the four inches. I'm gonna add eight for the top loop and eight for the bottom loop. So essentially for my 64 inch um, bow, I'm gonna to wanna to cut each individual strand 
76 inches long. So this is where we come to the jig. And do you need a jig? So, yeah, you gotta hold this part too. <laughs> I, got, I got the jig half done. Up so this is, this is the string jig. But what you can do is I can take a, a, a two by four, I can put a nail in at one end, take my tape measure out, measure off 76 inches, put another nail in at 76 inches, and then wrap around those two nails. And since you go around, if I wanna have six strands, go around three times. So I have six strands total, cut them off at the nails end, at each end. I've got six strands of 76 inches. So you don't need a jig. Now you can elect to do it of two ply simpler or three ply prettier. And typically what you want to do is each ply is going to be done of two different colors. And main reason for that, when we get into the twisting, you'll see that we blend it in a bit better. Um, so with two ply, as I say, that's more common. What I would typically do for a 12 strand string, I'd make one bundle of six and say green. And let me just throw things around here. I keep forgetting that I've got things half connected right now. Uh, and I do another one in blue. Great, I got two different colors, but I can go green, blue, and gold. And it gets nicer, but now I only need to uh, put four strands in each one. And like I say, the main purpose of the jig and I'm going to try to come in here and see if I can't. Uh, well, we'll show the jig here a bit. One of the things that I want to see with the jig here is up near the top. You can see that these nails, I don't know if while well, Mark showed there, you can see that the nails are all spaced apart. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to blend it in when I start making the loop. Because at one point, I've got to fold the 12 strands over to make my loop. So it's going to thicken up to 24 strands as I'm connecting them together. Now, that eventually is going to go back down to the 12 strands. But if I have it tapered like this, then what's going to happen is that as I blend that loop in, it's going to go from 24 down to 22, down to 20, down to 18, so far, so far, so far, down to uh, the 12 strand. So I'm just going to slowly put them out. If I've just laid the two by four on the floor and I've got uh, six strands of 76 inches, they're all the same length. So I can still get the tapering but what I have to do there is at some point, I have to start pulling strands out and not blend them in. So it's still possible, uh, but this just makes it easier. And of course, it makes it easier to do the math because the jig is marked off 64, 66, 70. So you just put it on there. That's the AMO length. And it lets me do it in a shorter period. I don't need to have 76 inches. But if you've only got one bow, then it's just as easy to put the T-boy four router, find some place that you can separate by the distance 76 or 78 or whatever it is that you need for your, uh, your bow. Then we're going to get to the actual twist. So then I'm going to try to get over here and, and make a string. I've also got some videos, but I'm going to see if we can do it without doing it. Uh, but the key thing in making it is it's two twists. So there's going to be one twist 
away from you. And then you're going to take the two ploys and twist them together. But you're going in the opposite direction. So one twist is going to be a single ploy and I'm twisting it away from me. Then the second twist is both plies twisted towards me. And if I have three plies, it's really just the same thing. Uh, they just kind of rotate in order. The one on top is going to go to the bottom. One in the middle is going to go to the top. And we're going to kind of flip that around. But it's just the same sort of thing. Now I'm going to pass some of this stuff over to Mark because I'm going to have her show me, have me do some stuff. And let me. So uh, why don't I'm you just turn off the screen sharing for a moment here? Yep. Oh, yeah, that helps. Here we go. Okay, so I've already got something started here. Well, this thing I feel was an experiment. Can you do something practical like this in a short video? What I would normally be doing uh, very easily in a, in a live classroom becomes awkward just for the movement of the camera around. So I've already started this one here, which is why I've been dangling along there. So we start up here, we've got number zero here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I've already done um, three. We can see I marked on three right now. You see four up there, but don't worry, the top one doesn't count, it's zero. So I go down to the nails at the bottom. Come up to my peg set at 64. Up to the top, in there. If you want to play with this, anything that you have that's a wax thread, you could play with it and, and kind of do the same practice on the looping, whether it's bowstring material or not. You can still end up making the loops. And then once you get bowstring material, play with it there. So I'm now at the sixth one. So time to take out my handy dandy pocket knife. And cut the strands. So here I now have six, if I don't get it caught up in the microphone, six strands, the longest one is 76 inches, but as we can see here, there are different lengths in there. I will attempt to. Now I'm going to wax the string. And I can see that things are still being shown there. Right. Now what I'm just doing is I'm putting extra wax on the part that's going to be making up my loop. So my loop is going to be um, eight inches and a little bit more going down into it because it's got to go back into the rest of the string. So I just add some extra beeswax onto the two ends here. And then once that's done, I put it aside. I grab another one. And I do it all again. And it's 
let's get it on the other side of that nail. Again, the same idea. I'm starting up at zero, going down to the one mark six. A little bit of a tug there. Put the knife where I'm not going to stab myself. Wax up the ends. Line my ends up here. Now I want eight inches. And very conveniently, my grid here has eight inches marked on it. My jig has eight inches marked on it here. I'm going to grab it there. Make sure they're both kind of evened up. And there's the eight inch mark. Now, blue's on top right now. So I'm gonna twist it away from me. All right, twist it away from me. Then I wanna put the blue on the bottom. So I'm now gonna twist it. The other direction, green's on top. Blue, green. So it's a twist away, twist towards, twist away, twist towards. So I've got a little bit going on there. I was looking to see if I had my clip there, but I don't have my clip handy. We've knocked it off. I'm just going to put a clip down here. Main reason being is I want to make sure I know where I start it from. What I want to do here is braid enough of this to make my loop. How big should that loop be? If I'm dealing with a modern recurve, the top loop is usually gonna be three inches in circumference. And conveniently again, I do have a three inch mark on there and I'm about two thirds of the way there. So I've got two inches on there. It's just to point out here, what gives the Flemish twist its ability, of course, it's the two twists there. Because I'm twisting in two opposite directions, they will essentially lock each other up. Okay. 
Then just check again. And there I map my three inches. So I'm going to bring it over, get rid of my clip. And I'm going to put my green to green and my blue to blue. And so that's why I like to have the two different colors. I'll do a little bit of a press in here, but I'm not too worried about that at this point. Now it's just same thing. Twist away, flip it over. Twist away and then twist towards me. And again, remember right now on that green, I'm looking really at 12 strands because it's doubled up. I've got the tail and the main part there. And the same with the blue. I've got the tail of six strands, the main part is six strands. I got 12 in there. But what's going to be happening at one point here? is I'm going to get rid of each of these little tails because there's one that's going to be disappearing soon. And I'll be going from the uh, 12 down to 11, so forth. And as I say, between the whole thing here, we're quite thick, but we'll be steadily bringing that thinner and thinner as we blend it in. Just getting rid of some of the extra twists there. The string starts knotting up underneath us there because of all the twisting. More of a grabbing. Just down to a few of the strands in the tail left. What I want to typically do is go about one inch below the last of the tail. So you can see that it's gradually getting uh, thinner. We're pretty much at the end of it right now. And I, I think with that blue there, I've got. Uh, Nothing left but the original six now. And I'll just keep doing that. So I always say it's easier to make a string than talk about it. it takes less time. And I'm just ballparking it, but I'm saying that's about an inch. I will usually put it back on my post here just to tighten it up a bit. Pull on it a bit, get it nice and tight. And there we have one loop done. And what I need to do now is go down to the bottom. And to do that, I'm going to do one thing first. I'm going to get my little uh, device to... I've used my big toe, but I prefer a little rod that I can put it over. And then I can put that on the floor, stand on it, get rid of the extra twist in my string here, because I want to get this back up here and I want to make sure that they're both equally stretched on there.
And I'm going to do exactly the same thing on this one that I did again. So I need to come down, find my eight inches. Make sure I get it taut. If I don't have it tight, if I avoid it, the camera there, I got it uh, loosened up there a bit. So I find my eight inches and I just rinse and repeat. So something you can sort of do while watching television or something like that. Now we did create a video of, or actually a number of videos for this process as well. So we can uh, upload them uh, in uh, perhaps the, uh, on the Baronial website or our own website our own Facebook, uh, we'll, we'll uh, figure that one out. This bottom loop uh, on a recurve is typically only about two inches. So I'm looking at here and I want to come down a little bit, a couple more. And the main reason for that is you leave the um, got a bright light shining in my eyes. There we go. All right. Match them up again, colors. Morgan put her spotlight down to the point that I couldn't see the colors because it was just shining in my eyes. Same thing again, twist away. Now, we mentioned that B50 has a stretch aspect to it. Uh, my understanding is the BCY um, brand has, why they're both polyester has a slightly less stretch. So then theory that should make it a little bit uh, of a better string material. But I haven't had a chance to try it yet. And I just got some wax linen, so I'll be probably trying that next. And twist the individual plies away and then the bundle towards me. Again, I'm coming to the end of it. The final twist that I end up doing, I always get Mark to check it out there because my eyes go wrong on me at one point. She and, wants to twist it the reverse or way that it needs to go. This part's not exciting. It's just a repeat of what we did at the top. Well, I would I would debate, you know, the only way it would make it exciting if it actually was a dance. Again, I want to go down about an inch. And I'm hoping I haven't. Uh, yeah, my my Mark's playing with my camera there because she's putting her fingers on things. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Are we still in? You're still there. It's just for whatever. No? No, don't do that. Okay, well, switch over to my camera. Okay. Yeah, you're still. Okay. If you can turn my camera on, I'm at my mute, my. uh... Talkies. Audio, that's the word. No, yeah, I'm just trying to stand up. Okay. All righty, we're switching over to cameras because uh, Marg accidentally turned off my, my machine. So let's get in here. We've got the uh, loops here. And what I would normally want to do here at this point is sort of tighten them up there. I'm going to pass. No, Mark, put that down. We won't worry about that right now. There we go. So here we go. We've got us both on there. Which way do you want me to turn it, Mark? Okay. No, just turn it that way. Turn it that way. Turn it that way. So she's telling me which way to turn it. And what I'm just doing here is putting a number of twists in the string. Now I rushed this once, I might have a little bit of a slack in there, which uh, probably will mean that afterwards I would take it and undo it. I'm just trying to find my light. All right. It's okay. Yeah. But we'll call it right there. And then that's essentially the bow string. But what I'd want to do with that is and we did one earlier today is get it onto the uh, bow and i'm going to leave it on the bow for a couple of hours so i'm going to leave the bow strung up and part of that is to allow it to stretch out so that right now this is a fairly low brace height so it's, it's a fairly low brace height right here right now. And that's because it's been sitting here stretching for a little bit of time there. Then what I would do with Flemish twist is once I've allowed it to stretch out, now I'm going to twist it up, tighten it up, and then I will do the serving on it. And I'm going to pass that over to Mark. So that was our, our madhouse attempt to try to do it um, through Zoom cameras when we don't have things on there. And at some point, we'll figure out what happened to my video on there. As I say, I think Mark dropped me out of there at some point. Probably. Well, we're both still here. So I could ask, is there any questions um, on doing it? I see a number of things there. These people come in there. Okay. Uh, any questions? I, I was checking there. I don't see questions there right now. Those of you that work with with threads, I see. I see Kiva talking, but I don't know she's talking to us. No, she says. I don't know if Mark wants to do a demo of, of serving a string. I don't, I'm not set up for that. Oh okay. yeah. She says she's not set up for it. I'm gonna leap Good in evening. and ask a question. You mentioned that this evening you all. Use the same process for a crossbow string. So generally for a crossbow string, um, while you can do Flemish twist, the math is all different. And most people will do a continuous loop for a, uh, for a crossbow string. So I, I don't have my continuous loop jig up here for crossbows. It's literally, in my case, it's two nails in a board uh, and I wrap the string around it. Real fancy ones have the arms adjust because what you have to do is you have to serve them with the Flemish twist. There's no need to serve this part of it. 
So you're only serving where the arrow is actually going to sit down in the middle. And your, where your hand touches the string. Where your hand is touching the string on there. But you don't need to serve up here, and it's very strong. Um, one of the things about look at this is this is up here 12 individual strands. And we mentioned each one of them, each one of those strands has the strength of 35 pounds breaking strength. So if I actually lost a couple of strands on there, I still have sufficient strands that the bow is not going to dry fire on me or that the string is going to snap on me there because there's enough strands to hold it. Now, one of the problems with a continuous loop string is that it is one strand wrapped 12 times. Um, in reality, you're going to do 24 times because if I want that 12 strands in the loop, I actually would have to wrap 24 loops there and I'd be 24 down in, the, in this part, but only 12 up in here. Now, what a lot of people will do with the continuous loop is they might still do the 12 strands, um, but to because they'll only go down to six is they'll add uh, 12 additional short strands just in the loop area. But like I say, it's literally two nails um, set about 26 inches apart from my crossbow on it there. Did they used to dye their bowstrings? That's a answer that we won't really know. Um, bowstrings don't really survive too much. We got uh, the bows. We there's a lot of debate even um, when we're looking at the power of the bows, because we know some of the bows from the Mary Rose are up over 160 pounds, but they're also looking at the, what I talked about, the strength of the, the power of it. They're also looking at the thickness of the knocks and some of the arrows. And when you look at it, you have to say, okay, if the string was this thick, how much could the bow be? Now, whether, we have to be careful when we talk about four times or anything like that, because most of us are not going to actually find out how thin of a string we can use, because it means doing testing to a point that our bow breaks, uh, if you really want. So we just kind of have to do some modeling and say, this is what the safe margin is. We don't know if they would have bothered with those safe margins, um, but there has been some idea that the, the string thickness for the arrows would not support a 160 pound bow. It had to be less than that. But again, we aren't using the exact same materials. They could have dyed their strings. Um, we only think that we would look at is from the picture side of it. Unfortunately, there's nothing in the picture side that would indicate they had dyed their strings. And a lot of people will do the Flemish twist with the same color. It's just easier to do it if you do two colors. to chat to see if there's any other questions. Okay, so uh, so Agarad meant to mention, if you have the strings the same length, you can line them up the center to create the fade. Yes, you can do that. Now, when you do that, you have to rethink your math a bit too, because you are gonna change the overall length of the string. So definitely you can do that. I mean, you could also just go in and trim the edges, um, but you could do it by the staggering. It's just that when I say, okay, I've got 76 inches. If I start pulling one string up one centimeter, another string up one centimeter, I'm going to be making that 76 inches, 78 inches. So it's gonna change uh, my math a little bit on it. But it's, it's, it's doable. You just have to kind of rework the math on it. Kiva asked how many uh, bow strings do you go through in a given year? How many bow strings do I go through in a given year? My bow still has its uh, string, uh, string on it that I made quite a few years ago. My bow still has its string on it that I made quite a few years ago, uh, partly because I haven't shot that as much as I've wanted to. But it, it all depends on what kind of wear and tear you give it. Um, you know, how you're treating the string when it's uh, not in use as well, too, will make a difference. Um, generally, if you're going to make one bowstring, you might as well make a spare or two uh, so that you have them handy all the time. Bowstrings I don't go through uh, very much. Um, 
it's still always good, as you said, to have two bow screens and to shoot them both. Um, the reason for that is if you do have a bow string break, you're say in a, a competition, you suddenly realize your bow strings frayed or to the point, you got to retire it. You put a brand new fresh string on it that you haven't shot, your arrow is going to behave differently. So if you kind of have two bow strings and you rotate them, then you don't necessarily have that worry that if a string goes on you in the middle of a competition, that it, it's, it's, oh great, my arrows are all going to behave differently. Crossbow strings are a little bit different. Crossbow strings, I go through on a regular basis. There's more wear on them um, because they're riding along the table uh, of the crossbow. So they got a lot more uh, riding on it. Uh, the bow itself, usually not too much of a problem. I've had a bow string destroy a bow, uh, but it didn't actually destroy the string itself. Uh, serving you will change a lot. So the serving is something that, that you will need to do on a more regular basis. So I might change my serving um, three or four times a season, but the string itself probably is gonna last me the whole season. Where can you buy the string material from? Uh, the, if you're not going to buy it online, uh, my first choice would be Borman's. Um, Cabela's also carries them as well. Uh, I haven't been into Cabela's recently, but the last place I bought mine was Borman's. And of course, if you are going online, lots of places to buy them online, um, Three Rivers, uh, other places, but yeah. Support Bormans, they're local. Then check out Kabilas and stuff. Uh, John made up, uh, John McAndrew made up a, um, a linen bowstring recently. So he's the only one that I'm knowing of right now that's using it. it it's common in, I would say, it, it, um, Talking to boyers outside of the SCA, I'll find there's more common outside of there because they want to play with them and stuff. Um, here we do get concerned about safety. So it also depends on the bow. Uh, if someone's making an all wood bow, they might be more inclined to use linen. If they're using a modern uh, bow, then they're, they're more likely to just go with the modern material. It's a safety factor as well. They know the safety factor of the B50. They don't necessarily want to do the brake test. Um, so with the linen thread that I bought recently, you know, I was uh, trying to see if I could pick up 25 pound weights with it, um, 10 pound weights. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. The other one made, one made up there. She wants to switch. Just let go of it. There we go. There we go. In theory, it's easier for me. There we go. There's something there about. Uh... Yes, yes, I'm, I'm sure it would make you probably fuzz it up even more. So, but there might be other uses too. <laughs> well, yeah, it's got a lot of wax in it, so. Um... And, and that protected the, the, the bow string from moisture. So it's, it was quite uh, convenient on there. And that's, of course, going to make it a little bit of a good fire starter on there. Um, not a reason to keep it around. Um, what, what breaks your budget? Um, I got that at the Honeybee Center. Um, I 176 in Fraser Highway. I think that was a buck twenty-five uh, for that stick, and um, I don't know. I think I bought it three years ago. I, I'm sure I bought more than one, but uh, yeah, you probably did. And uh, Kiva mentioned the good one on Main Street. Any okay. good candle making shop, I would suspect, would have the the, the beeswax in there as well. I'm going to ask a silly question. Why is it called a Flemish twist? Is there a Swiss twist and a Neapolitan twist and a Cheshire twist? Could be. Um, 
I'm assuming that it originated in Flemish, you know, in, in the Flemish areas and in Belgium and stuff like that. But for sure, who knows? It it may have just been a name that's getting on there. So why are French fries French fries? The Belgians claim invention for that. Belgians claim a lot of things. <laughs> Those Belgians. So quickly, while Kevin is restoring the power to his laptop, we have to talk about Kevin for a very brief incident here. So oh, he's missed it. Make a bowstring out of Kevin's hair. A bowstring out of Kevin. There is a Norse story uh, about a gentleman who um, has pissed off his wife. And he's under attack and his bowstring breaks. And so he needs to make a new one and he wants to use his wife's hair. And because he pissed her off, she wouldn't let him. And she had such long, luscious hair. So he died. Is that they actually did use hair. So uh, at least according to that legend, they did use hair. Now, is hair um, a good choice? I'm not sure about the, the strength and uh, breaking material of it, but obviously it shows up in a Norse saga that, that they would make a string out of hair. Sinew, by the way, um, which has been used as a bowstring material, material, actually is quite elastic and it's not an ideal bowstring material. It's used in, on bows, um, you know, on, on the Asiatic bows, because of its elasticity, it, it gives a, a nice snap to the bow when you put it on the back of the bow. Any other questions from anybody? Yeah, the Honeybee Center is close to, to the fighter practice, presuming we go back to the same areas. Future boat projects or bow string projects. I need a bow string for my bow, so that'll we be We were supposed my to next. make one for it. <laughs> it's got to be the right colors, man. And I'm all pretty. Um, future future projects, well, let's, let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm working, working on crossbows, crossbow, so, so maybe we'll, we'll look at doing that. something, uh, how to make a crossbow uh, on a dare. Some people have been talking about arrow straightening and maybe even just arrow making. It, it kind of an experiment here to see how the demos work. I wasn't quite sure. And of course, I don't know how well it looked um, because I was doing it, um, so I couldn't always see it. You know, probably didn't necessarily have the perfect camera for, for trying to record it in there. No, my camera is actually better. I'm just uh, going into the events and seeing if I can uh, upload the video uh, into the uh, events. Okay, let me go there. It is embedded into the PowerPoint. We just didn't get to it. Well, I can, if uh, people want me to share the uh, videos, I can certainly do that. If that's what they would like me to do, just let me know right now. I said, sure, let's uh, begin. Okay, let me just get to share screen. PowerPoint. Come on, we'll open up PowerPoint. There we go. Come on. Click to that one. There we go. Okay. Sorry, all these extra things are going to drive me nuts. I'm going to see it. The screen is in the way. Okay, you've just got. Oh, you don't. Are those there, actually there, there, videos? You have to click on them. Okay. Oh, down there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Her uh, The Zoom is hiding part of it.
It is better lighting, I'm sure of that. But. <laughs> If you want to talk why this is going on, because you've kind of seen it already once, um, go right ahead. If you got any questions, I will keep trying to answer them. Make up answers that I don't have. Sorry, Jure, we did not hear that. So for um, bow strings, whether they're homemade or not, um, I can't say offhand that there's uh, any difference in shooting them. So I would, I would think that um, I haven't seen any difference. Let's put it that way there. I haven't seen any difference. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the bow when the, um, it's the archer that makes the difference as far as the accuracy. I'll put it that way there more than the bow. We don't blame our equipment. We have to blame ourselves. But we do have a bunch of excuses that we can blame someone else on. My favorite is I paid for the whole target. I'm going to use the whole target. You can play with your string um, in some ways to to try to improve things. So, um, for example, we talked about brace height. We talked about the number of strands. If I take my bow string down, because I know 12 strands is too much for a 30-pound bow, is way overkill. If I take it down to eight strands, I can get, a faster arrow speed, so a faster uh, feet per second out of my out of my bow, so I can make my bow uh, run actually more efficiently. Now, another thing that is sometimes that you can do as far as um, dropping the brace height down, and you will find sometimes one of the reasons why long bows will sometimes have it is to sort of uh, they'll have a slightly smaller brace height. The power function that we're working on when we're looking at uh, delivering the power to the arrow is essentially you got to look at what the power stroke is. So say if I've got a um, my, my uh, brace height is 8 inches and I'm pulling back 28 inches, it's 30 pounds uh, pull at 28 inches, that's working on the arrow for 20 inches. Then it comes to the end, it comes to the brace height. 28 down to, to eight, we've got 20 inches of power stroke on there. If I bring my brace height down to seven inches, I get one more inch where that poundage of the bow is going to go on to it. So I can get a little bit more uh, feet per second out of it that way there. Now saying that any bow, there is a perfect um, amount of brace height for it that'll get the maximum efficiency out of it. Typically, that's going to be the quietest um, brace height. Uh, it is one of the things that we, as an archer, that you listen to. If the bow doesn't sound properly, adjust the brace height, bring it up a half an inch, down a half an inch um, for putting it in there. But some people will do it deliberately. 
flight shooters will often go with uh, the number of strands on their bow to almost the point of breaking. They're going to go a minimum safety because they're going to try to get that extra feet per second to get that extra distance out there. So uh, you can do it there. Do you find it's more economical to make uh, the strings in the long run? Uh, not for me, because I mostly make a lot of strings for other people. And so therefore I'm spending money on material and giving it away. Um, so I guess that's probably not there. What is brace height? Um, so brace height um, is essentially the, um, get the bow over here. Bring the other bow too. The other one's unstrung. Yeah. And yes, it is more economical. But yes, it is more economical. Definitely a, a roll of that is pretty cheap. And I can make a lot of bowstrings out of that um, material. Okay. So in the in the bow there, when we string up the bow, I'm going to go back to here. The brace height is essentially where does that string sit in relationship to the to the bow? So how high up is it? So depending on where it is there. So this is a very low brace height right now. It should be probably about another inch higher than that. It should be about an inch higher than my thumb. And to change the brace height, you take the one end off of the string and you twist it. Put more twist in, that will shorten the string. If you have to go the other way, you untwist. Do you want me to do it? No. All right. So why is brace height important? Um, again, it, it's brace height is going to give you the uh, the right brace height is going to give you the best arrow speed. And it's going to be the most efficient arrow speed. So it's going to it's going to have a deal with how much power goes into the arrow and how fast the arrow comes off. Too much brace height, you're not going to get that power stroke that you want. And the arrow is not going to have the same energy put into the arrow. If it's too low of a brace height, you're probably not gaining anything at a certain point. You can a little bit there. You can get to a certain amount in there. Is there a good plan for a jig? Um, there's all sorts of plans on the web. I grabbed mine off of um, somebody out of Aldemir at one time um, in there. I could probably find the directions, but uh, search around for Flemish twist jig. You'll find a ton of them out there. Three Rivers does sell a jig, but they're simple enough to make. What I would suggest doing after you've made it up, check the measurements out, because I have found in some cases that sometimes if they've been made from something and then adjusted a couple of times by someone else, you can sometimes find that the marks aren't necessarily matching up to the right uh, mounts on them. But just go with the idea there that essentially you're looking at the AMO minus four plus 16. So essentially AMO plus 12. And if you, if you draw it up there, you should be able to, if you took a single strand, you should be able to look at that and, and measure it out and see what it is. Just to make sure, because I have found sometimes that I'm making a string, oh gee, it says it's 64, but it really wants me to use the 62 gig spot. Um, is silk ever used for strings? As I mentioned up front, um, yes, it was. Um, a lot of Chinese bows used to use silk as well. Not so much in the European cultures though. But it's mentioned in talks of Phyllis as being a string material. So the so um, you know English were aware of it uh, around Ashram's time. Indian um, Indian bows 
period, also used steel strings. They, they, had, they made steel bows and they used steel strings. If you bring steel string to uh, uh, an SCA range, expect that the uh, uh, marshal in charge will tell you to get rid of it. Steel strings, we they can be very, very strong, of course, but at the same time, there's no way to really test whether it's going to fail. And if they fail, they can you know fail kind of dramatically. Um, so, uh, and with the silk string on that, I can't answer. I don't know, Angarod, whether it's uh, whether it was a single filament or pleated like our thread. I would assume it would still be um, some kind of a of a twisted probably in there. But having never having only have mentioned that it was used is all that I've ever kind of found in there. Not details on the string itself. So I'm going to use B50 most often just simply because um, I saw, probably have about eight spools of it right now in different colors. I've only got four spools up here right now, but uh, I got another four downstairs. And there was a question, will there be another lion's den for doing the servings in the future? We have not set that up. Uh, <laughs> though I think that Kiva is thinking of it, um, but uh, it's it's possible, possible. Okay, serving is is one of those things that uh, uh, you know takes you ten fifteen minutes to do, but but takes uh, a really long time to explain what you're doing. It's essentially whipping. The, uh, the string uh, to a large extent there, but uh, there's some nice little tools that make it in it. And it's all good and fine until you get to the end and have to uh, tie it up. That's when it becomes a problem. The last little bit. Yes, I do. I do make bows. Um, And there's, uh, Akiva mentions that they're looking at doing an evening introduction to archery. And uh, I think she's looking at uh, September 19th. And as Angarad says, uh, as she's dealing with serving, starting and finishing are the worst. Well, yes and no. It's I find it a very straightforward process myself. Um, but uh, having said that, the jig uh, is very, very helpful. It uh, makes it uh, a much simpler process. And there's a few little tricks that you can do for, for um, uh, the finish part.
So bow making is also one of those things that it's it's um, it's a lot of rinse and repeat. It's a lot of just scrape small shavings off of wood, you know, get a potato peeler out there, scrape some wood off of it. I don't use a potato peeler, but uh, it's the same effect. But with bow making, you do want to go slow and, and careful because, uh, you know, at the beginning, it's it's that, yeah, you've got a lot of material to remove. And then halfway there, you realize, oh, well, I got to be very careful in this spot and that spot. One of the tools I always tell beginning boyers that they need to have is, is, a, is a bucket of water, uh, a cold water, ice water. And every time you think you can speed things up, stick your head in the bucket of ice water. <laughs> and we have one last video to play. Uh, I'll put that on. Okay. Yeah, for, for the bow, I'll, I'll usually start my rapid tool materials will uh, will typically well, it can be an axe depending on how how much it is there. Um, but um, a farrier's rasp uh, or a, uh, um, a microplane are uh, two of the things that I'll often use to take uh, material off quickly. And uh, we have to make sure we separate out my microplanes because we have one microplane that's kept in the kitchen drawer um, for food stuff. And then we have my microplane that's kept down in the tool shed for uh, working with wood. Don't want to confuse the two of them. But there is a point where, yeah, it doesn't matter what you use. Knife is, is, is you're going to have to do a lot of the tillering with just something like a knife or a scraper. And that's the last of the videos. So, yeah, we got them on there. You can stop share. There we go. Yeah, the the foot uh, device, some sort of uh, way of. Uh, having that tension is really helpful. Uh, I find my one of my middle toes works really, really well. Uh, just slide the loop on and that way I can really stretch it up. But uh, the um, plastic uh, tubing was great. It's from Gerhard. These are these were. Um... What was I think was going to be bolts for uh, for a chukana that he was making, so I, I've got I got a box of them, but that's what those were from. Those actually did come from Gerhard. So that's I think the main things as far as the the uh, string making. Um, if you want to play with it. 
again, any wax cord that you have, it doesn't have to necessarily be bolstering material. You can at least play with it. If you've got some wax butcher's cord or something like that, you can play with it uh, just to give it that idea to see how to, to make the loops. And then once you get the bolstering material, you can put it in, uh, in there as well and, and start working with it. And yes, there was a kitty there. Usually doesn't come into the shot. Obviously wants attention. Sis, aren't you going to give me food soon? Well, I think we've pretty much uh, covered our topic. I don't think there's anything else we are thinking of adding. Uh, last chance for questions. <laughs> I think this has been an amazing talk. I, I, I have underestimated the complexities and the effort that goes into making a good bowstring for sure. Well, it's a piece of equipment, and uh, you know, like with any equipment, uh, the more uh, finesse that you put into it, uh, the better the result. And the result in period was, of course, to either get your food or kill your enemy. So you want to be 100% on that. That makes total sense. That's great. So, so normally what happens at the end of the talks is that sort of it, obviously it wraps up and then there's just sort of more informal space for discussions like arts and science discussions or whatever. Um, and then the speakers can, can stay if they want to or are free to sign off, whatever is easiest for them. But a huge thank you from us. Um, thank you so much for coming back, Your Excellencies, and giving us your time and your knowledge and your experience in this field. Um, we definitely have a lot of, of new people in the barony who are really interested in, in archery. Um, so we're going to have uh, an intro to archery in, in September. Um, and just having you guys here, having you folks here as a resource is so wonderful. So thank you so much for coming out today. Well, thank you for asking. And I have to say one of the reasons that uh, I got uh, started down the road of becoming uh, governor of Tudor was because John was teaching all these wonderful things to the people at the archery and somebody came and I realized they didn't benefit from the same knowledge I did. And I just felt that we needed to share that. And wonderful. so that just started the whole ball rolling and, mm -hmm. and uh, we just, I'm so glad that it's continuing. It's wonderful. And then we have a, a new baronial YouTube channel. So this talk will be available uh, on that. So it's, it's been recorded for posterity. I'm just so excited. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> posterity <laughs> thanks you. Well, does anyone have any, any other questions or any other um, maybe arts and science projects that they're working on after this, this wonderful look at our at archery arts and sciences? Well, I'm working on arrows. <laughs> oh, pretty much, neat. Pretty much all, all the time. And do you do, what do you do with your arrows? Is that for a target? Uh, yeah, just to target archery and I make them for individuals who ask or whatever, so. Oh, neat. Bit, bit hard getting tra getting uh, hand on wood, uh, your hands on wood shafts right now, but other than that. I'm still waiting for an order. <laughs> Yeah, Borman's is a, a little uh, backlogged. Yeah, like everything else. <laughs> um, has there been any news about when we're able to get back to practices? Are we going back to the old farm or to the farm in Delta or what? Uh, as far as as far as I know. Um, that is the spot I, I have i actually uh was asking kevin uh, uh yesterday about uh how that was going to work out uh when we start back up and i have been inquiring about uh different spaces uh just to see what was out there but, but keep in mind provincially right now we're still limited to bubbles of 10. so yeah. Yeah. a practice is really not something that can happen yet um, in bc 
that's yeah. hence why I said when we can. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't expect it to happen any like in the next couple of weeks or anything. Just, no, no, I was just no. trying to just trying to get ahead of the game. <laughs> and, and watching the numbers go up. I'm thinking a couple of months. And we're, we're... <laughs> yeah, we need those vaccinations. Mm -hmm. mm. Everybody's so quiet this evening. It's almost intimidating to ask or say anything. <laughs> no, no. Feel free to, to speak up and stuff like that. Yeah. It's lovely to see all your faces. Yours too. Well, when I have my camera on. Yeah, yeah I've got to say, oh, hey. Yeah. Hang on. Um, I don't have a camera, so I can't do that. There we go. Okay, there's my mug. There Hi. You go. Hi. <laughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm? I have a question just in um, uh, general uh, archery A and S. Like I do, I do leather working. Mm -hmm. But to do a class like this, uh, like you guys are, you're doing a show and tell basically, but nobody had, well, I don't know about nobody, but uh, it's very hard for people to follow along because they don't have the tools or, or the materials necessary, like you would at a regular event. So how do you feel that works? Well, I do here? think the PowerPoint uh, that uh, then is shareable and will be um, I, on the uh, video, recorded video, I believe, uh, will be, uh, is super helpful because then you reference back, reference back. Um, but uh, yeah, there's limitations to the format for sure. But having the pre recorded video. I think uh, is helpful on key steps. Is there any way that you could put um, ahead of time, like a list of supplies if there is a class? I, I did debate doing that. I did debate sort of saying, hey, if you've got some um, wax cord or something like that, because you, you can go to Michael's and get some wax linen for beading. Um, and you could use that to start with to sort of make the loop. And, and I debated sort of doing that um, of course, with everything else, I'm running a bunch of other stuff doing it at the same time, so I probably didn't uh, put it in there. Um, and it's also sort of, oh, do I want to encourage people to go out and run as just shops at this point? Uh, ordering things online is one thing, but... Um, I, I do think that the time constraints um, are a little bit more challenging in this format, um, at least when you're... Uh, together with uh, people in a room, you can see exactly what someone is doing. But as you can see, uh, showing something over this camera is not easy. Yeah. So, so when someone has an issue and they're trying to show what their issue is, I think that creates more challenges too. So mm -hmm. a, a different, uh, different camera setup, different sound setup, I think would be, um, pretty key to having it go smoothly. Because there's this, there's this, the two side of it, there's the demo side of it, but then say if Ellen wants to show me um, her string that she's made and what issues she's having with it, that's, that's what we'd normally be able to get to see in a class, in a regular class if we were in person. And it could still kind of be done um, but it's, it's a little bit harder for someone to troubleshoot. But overall, like I say, I would say it's more, what did, what did you guys think? Like for example, on Garage, how did you feel it went and what would you be able to pull from it if you were gonna go off and um, uh, do a class on leatherworking? Did you, did you pick up anything from our demo that you'd say, oh, I wouldn't do that or, or I would do that? Uh, well, I think uh, first off, there was um, um, just the camera was uh, almost too movable. And, and mm -hmm. I know that because you have the one camera and you need to actually be able to point it at a string. And the string isn't necessarily in one spot. Uh, with leather working, you have your, um, your granite and it doesn't move. And technically, you shouldn't be moving from that area. So it'd be a little bit easier to set up cameras. What it wouldn't be very easy to do is like uh, show your tools because then it has to focus on the on the smaller aspects. So not impossible, but it, it gets a little frustrating. 
wouldn't um a tripod with a flex net neck on it that holds your camera be like an overhead shot you know what i mean yeah possibly would that be more conducive to both situations i suspect multiple cameras uh in multiple positions would be probably the best option because mm. uh mm. sometimes your hand is going to be like in the way but there, it necessarily yeah. needs to be yeah. but if it's at a different angle it shows it better yeah i've watched lots of uh youtube uh tutorials on on leather working and that seems to be something they they uh get around fairly well but they all have expensive equipment expensive equipment <laughs> yes i i struggle with lighting so it's kind of like uh, it's sometimes it's hard to see what I'm doing, let alone uh, uh, everybody seeing what I'm doing. Um, you need the uh, back reflectors that um, direct your light so they are actually in front of you to direct the light towards you, I do believe. Well, and I think the difference is, is that when you're doing a, a YouTube video, you're kind of thinking of the video. When you're here on a Zoom conference, um, you're kind of thinking, oh, I'm doing a Zoom. I'm, I'm, I'm in here on a Zoom thing on here. And mm -hmm. the main thing is kind of getting this communication through. So there's a little bit of a different mentality, but that's where, say, mixing them up a bit, like maybe doing the pre-recorded videos where you can sort of set the quality up for it and uh, putting them in there. And, uh, you know, we weren't sure if we we're going to do videos or just do some still photos of different things on there. Mm -hmm. But it, it's kind of like you're still kind of a little bit limited to the demo mode. Mm -hmm. um, not so much the interactive mode on it to, in the same way. So, uh, yeah. so that was sort of a, a, a sort of thing there. And, and I did sort of look at this as being a little bit of an experiment and, uh, and seeing how it went. Um, it's definitely something that's, I think, doable. There are definitely ways that could be done better if it was done another way and such like that. Because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, there's some things that a lot of these demos are just easier to sort of, yeah, I'll set up a video and just do the video. Uh, on it there, um, but trying to be interactive. And uh, I was hoping to hear more questions while I was talking, while I was doing some of the demos there. I think we I... were all trying to concentrate on how I, how we could see, because your lighting was, it yes. was very dark and it was really hard to see. And again, the moving around and that's the issue there. Well, yeah. when you set up the videos for us to watch afterwards, it was a lot better as I'm turning up my lighting here at home yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay there. well that's the same sort of thing here we suddenly realized right right we didn't set up all the lighting ahead of time on here and, and probably we should have done that oh my as i can see the mess of my background so we're going to turn off the big one <laughs> well that's where you use one of the zoom filters there so you become a cat now i haven't figured that out yet i'm yeah. still learning how to try to do bow strings let alone play around with modern mm -hmm. It's okay. We, you know, you the one that did the cat didn't realize he was a cat. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I guess there's a, a fine line between um, um, display and interaction. Yeah. And then and we kind of want the interaction, but um, the display is easier. The display is a little bit easier to work with, and it's something that you, as the leather uh, worker, is, is you can kind of work on that. The interaction side of it um, is a good tool for that. The Zoom's a good tool for that. Mm -hmm. But it also is going to depend on what we're looking at to be able to ask the right questions and stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I've, I've, I've made uh, plenty of strings before, and it was just trying to rack my brains, trying to figure out the right questions to ask you to, to, to uh, uh, expound upon. But uh, you covered pretty much everything that I could think of. Yeah, and I also, didn't do any yeah, break yeah. Yeah, it's also, uh, as you said, it's much easier to just do it than to explain it yeah. sometimes. <laughs> the combination was good tonight, though. I mean, for for experimenting with this Zoom and teaching and all of that, it's really good, actually. Again, the combination, watching the video afterwards to see clearly what you were doing with the string especially after you did the loops and how many twists you put in that and 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 all of that you know you could count almost how many you would put in yeah phones have a much better uh camera than uh pads so tablets. Uh, yeah i've yeah. got a, a webcam so and it's got a microphone in it but i use Which a headset for hearing you better yeah 
Oh, wow. But I'm going to bid adieu to you all. And thank you again for your tutorial. It was very informative. And we will talk you. to you all soon. OK, take care. Right. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 And I am actually going to uh, sign off now as well, too. So thank you all so much. Good night. Thank Good you. night.